Hi everyone, welcome to our panel today. Uh, we're going to be talking about gaming with chronic pain. Uh, I'm Stacey, I'm the accessibility design specialist for the Ubisoft Paris studio, uh, which means I'm very lucky and get to support all of our amazing games teams in making their games more accessible. Um, I'm going to be leading us through the panel today with these wonderful people. So a uh, very short introduction to me. Uh, chronic pain has been a part of my life for about eight or nine years. Um, and it's something that I have to think about and take into consideration every single day. Um, I have fibromyalgia and hypermobile EDS, uh, which basically means that I'm in pain all the time and my joints just don't like to stay where they're meant to be. Um, I also have POTS and uh, I'm autistic, so I will pass over to um, our lovely panellists to do a quick intro on themselves. Uh, Rue, do you want to go first? Hello, I am Rue. I am a disabled content creator, activist and streamer. Um, I also have um, hypermobile EDS um, and POTS. I also have um, ADHD. Uh, I get frequent dislocations and chronic pain and severe fatigue. Um, but I like to sort of channel that into activism and um, help and make the world a little bit more accessible. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that. I feel like we're all very, very similar in that respect. <laughs> it's yeah. great to have you here. Uh, Arabia, did you want to do a little intro for us? Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Lisbeth, but I am better known online than the name Arabia. I'm a content creator from Norway. Um, and I am born with something called cerebral palsy, which is a brain injury, which has been with me through all my life. But I didn't know about it before I was older. So I have gone parts of my life not understanding why I was in pain and why I was always fatigued. And now as I'm older, I have a plethora of other <laughs> illnesses and problems and disabilities. But most noticeable that I will be talking about today is that I have rheumatism arthritis. Cool. Thank you for the little intro. Uh, Colo? Hi, uh, I'm Colo. I am a content creator as well. Um, I primarily stream on Twitch. I'm also a YouTuber. Uh, and I'm also uh, an influencer consultant. So I work with brands, agencies and developers um, to talk about uh, how they market their game and the influencers that they work with and their approach uh, over there. Um, I'm also an ambassador for the charity Special Effect who help make gaming accessible to everybody, um, especially those with physical disabilities uh, or alternate needs uh, that maybe can't use or can't access the traditional control schemes um they are amazing um uh i uh, sit between uh, inflammatory arthritis but i sit somewhere between ankylosing spondylitis and peripheral spondyloarthritis um as they say six one and a half a dozen the others <laughs> between the two um and i also have adhd awesome thank you all so much for being here um to start us off i just wanted to talk a little bit about how chronic pain affects our day-to-day -day life um, I think chronic pain in particular can be invisible to other people at times. Um, so it can be easy to assume that we're fine, even when, you know, something's taking a great, a great deal of effort to do or to manage. And it definitely affects everyone differently. We've all got different disabilities. Um, so I'd love to hear from you all about how pain kind of affects your every day. Um, so let's start with Aravia this time. Okay. So I, it is a bit funny question because I uh, luckily am living in my own apartment now. I am on disability be benefits part time. So I have a job in an office that is really daytime job that is really easy for me. And I think I manage my life so easy on my medication, daily medication I need to take to suppress my immune system. And I think I do this wonderful life. I'm living good. And then one thing is set off. <laughs> One thing is not going according to plan and my whole day is ruined. Uh, so I need to live on like a really tight schedule or a really tight balance on what my body can handle. And as soon as I go outside of that, I will have pain that is not manageable with the medication I have. And I will get uh, what we call brain fog, which is when you're, it feels like you have fog in your brain. It, it says it in a name and uh, I will have uh, tremors. So I start shaking, which I struggle with every day, but it's more prone and I will start being 
noticed my pain because I have pain every day. You sort of stop thinking about it. It's there. It affects you, but it you you can't have it in like your frontal lobe all the time when you have it constantly. So that is why when I get something out of the ordinary that happens. So I every day I need to set like a every task I'm going to do, I need to think, is this worth the problems it's going to give me? And that is for everything. Like, should I take the car or the bus? Should I game this game that is really, really fun? Or should I game this game that is not that fun, but it doesn't make me hurt or in pain and so on and so on. And that I need to do hundreds of times throughout the day to figure out uh, how to manage my problem. Yeah, hundred percent. I think what you said about pacing is really important. And it's something that I have been struggling with the entire time I've been ill. And we, we, I think we, we all have like a, an idea in our heads of like, you know, if I do this thing, then maybe I can't do this other thing. And um, we all want to try and plan out our days so that we don't get, you know, triggered into this um, huge amount of pain, but it's difficult sometimes, especially when you're having fun. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, we definitely have to kind of think about like, you know, what's the what's the knock on effect of this going to be? And um, yeah, it's that those little decisions just hundreds of times every day um, that we kind of have to take. Um, Carlo, did you want to talk a little bit about about that? Yeah. So uh, similarly, I have a, a level, a base level of pain um, all the time. Um, the way that I tend to try and describe this is if you've ever had one of those days where you're just not feeling very well, maybe you've got a cold or maybe you've got a headache um, and that's kind of all you can think about. Like the, oh, I can't really do that because I've got a headache and it's it's a bit like that except all the time. Um, and uh, it does vary. So I will have varying levels of pain. Sometimes I'm able to identify what's triggered it. Uh, for example, I've... Um, I've done something particularly strenuous uh, or done something too much, whatever it was, I've done the thing too much, or maybe my brain took over and I went to go and grab something out of instinct and my, I, and I didn't think about it and then I've got a few days recovery. Um, so yeah, so it can really vary for me. Um, it uh, similarly makes me really tired. It's really fatiguing uh, to be in pain all the time. Um, and something that I think is really important to me is to say it's not necessarily that I can't physically do something. It's what the payoff is, like what the exchange is. So uh, if I play a game that is really, really heavy, so I, I use an adaptive controller, I use the Xbox adaptive controller, um, and I play partially with my feet. Uh, so if there is a game where I am using both my hands and my feet, um, I am able to do that, but it's how long am I able to do that for? And also how long am I able to do that for before it then impacts my ability to do something like wash my hair or like squeeze a ketchup bottle or drive or any of those things um, that, that then are things that are in my normal life that would be fantastic if I can do independently. Um, but also this game is amazing and I really want to play it. So is it then going to be worth it for me to play 10 minutes and then come back to it? Is it a game where I can do that slowly and gradually or will that just not make sense and I'll forget the narrative and all of those things? Um, so yeah, so I think it's really fluctuating. Some days are uh, much better than others pain-wise, but it is always there. And for me, it's always about discussing what the pay, what the trade-off is. Um, I can do it, but actually what am, what am I gonna sacrifice in, in order to be able to do it? And can I sacrifice that thing today? Is it manageable for me today? Yeah, hundred percent. And I, I think it's really, it's really interesting hearing people talk about how much things fluctuate because I think a lot of the time people maybe don't understand um, that we have to make those kind of trade-offs because, you know, they might see us go into an event. Um, you know, we might post a photo from an event and they'll be like, wow, they're doing so well. They must be in no pain today. And then what they don't see is the three days that we've had to take off literally lying in bed to recover and stuff like that. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's, it's really difficult sometimes to kind of get people to understand that kind of the nature of, of pain and how it does tend to fluctuate. Um, but then how we all live with some kind of like normal level of pain. <laughs> We've just got a baseline level of pain all the time. Um, Rude, did you have any um, anything you wanted to talk about, about kind of your everyday life living with pain? 
Yeah, so I I mentioned earlier that I have like chronic pain, fatigue and dislocations and stuff. I say would say that at the moment I spend probably about 80% of my day in bed. Um I am like and and last year I was completely bed bound for the entire year um because I had something called a cerebrospinal fluid leak um which was due to my EDS and meant that I couldn't even sit upright in bed. So I've had to sort of learn how to play games lying down as well, which was interesting. Um, but I also use a wheelchair and I think it's really interesting what you're saying about how like one day you can look at someone at an event and think, oh my God, they're doing really well because they've only got a walking stick at that event. And then the next day, like you're in your wheelchair and people can't seem to understand that because um, yeah, I use a wheelchair, but if I'm in a supermarket and something's on a top shelf and I'm on, in a, on a good day, I can stand up and get it. And people just, it blows their minds. So um but yeah, I also, um, my pots can make me sort of really dizzy. Um, and the brain fog is also met, was also mentioned by Revia, which is also something that I struggle with. I also have um, auditory processing issues. Um, so like I only ever use subtitles when I'm watching TV um, because it just makes it a lot easier. Um, and I... Yeah, just I think that's that's everything to be honest. And also pacing is really, really hard. I've been diagnosed for 11 years and I still don't know how to do it. So if you're someone that struggles with pacing, just know that you're you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's really interesting as well that many of us do have multiple disabilities that, you know, they quite often over, overlap. Mm -hmm. um, they interact with each other. It's not always like, you know, super simple or straightforward. Um, which is why I'm really glad we have this kind of panel so we can talk about those kind of things. Um, so for me, for example, the two that really just butt heads all the time, I've got the fibromyalgia, so the you know general chronic pain all over my body. Uh, cold weather makes my muscles seize up and makes the pain worse. Um, but hot weather makes me faint <laughs> with the pots. So there's there's no like... <laughs> There's like maybe a, a, a five degrees temperature where I'm like, wow, this is good. This is perfect. But like in the winter or in the summer, I'm very likely to either have a fainting spell or to have all my muscles seize up. So there's always this like this interaction between um, multiple disabilities and stuff like that. Um, so I just wanted to talk um, next about kind of gaming. I, I know some of you touched on it already about kind of the, the thoughts and the considerations that you have to make when you're when you're gaming. But um I thought it was important to just talk very briefly about like why gaming is important to you because I think sometimes people don't really realize what a big part of our lives it could be. Um, I've definitely had periods of, of, of my life where I literally couldn't leave the house and games were a freaking lifeline for me. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that I would have made it through those times in my life without, without video games. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to know about you guys like what do you get from video games and why is it important that you can play and you are able to play um Kolo do you want to go first with this one yeah sure so um my journey's been interesting in transitioning and understanding this more myself uh so at a few years of a, a series of conditions that were attributed to something else. For example, I was told I had repetitive strain and I was told I had uh, sciatica and, and a few other things. And then uh, things really came to a head, I want to say maybe three years ago now. Um, and all of those things were finally put together and they were like, ah, here's the, <laughs> this is what it is. Um, and I have been a gamer my whole life. Uh, it's been a really significant part of my identity and it's also been my source of community. It's been where I've made some of my best friends in my whole life who I'm so grateful for. And I think also in this day and age, it's, it's uh, often harder to find people geographically that would be your geographical community that you have lots of things in common with. Um, and actually something that I've, that's been fundamental in my life and my connection is being able to find those people people, my tribe, um, in it, online in a in a very different way and find that community and that sense of belonging. And uh, that for me comes hand in hand with gaming. And while gaming is the thing that gets us there, like that's the, the thing, maybe initially the reason that you're there is to play a game, but actually something that comes from that is a sense of belonging, uh, that sense of connection, something that you can do independently, something that you uh, that you could do on your own on your own in a world where actually 
I there are days when I can't do things on my own and I do need help. Um, and so to have that thing that I can just turn on and do and have that moment of independence uh, is is absolutely vital. And I found that when uh, before I was diagnosed and when I was going through that process and I before I had my adaptive controller and understood that there was a bit of a I want to say a bit of a hole in my life, a bit of a blank um, where I didn't really know what to do. Uh, I found that there were only so many audiobooks that I could listen to. Um, I was struggling to hold a book open or use an e-reader. And at that point, you become very bored. It becomes very hard to uh, just get through the day. But like you were saying, Stacey, yeah. so to have something that you are able to do that gives you that community, that sense of belonging, that this is who I am, or that you can engage, you can go outside in a game, you could do all of these wonderful things. To have that, be able to do that independently, not only is it beautiful for all of those kind of things, but for me, it was absolutely fundamental in keeping myself well mentally uh, because otherwise all that was going on in my brain is I'm in pain I can't do anything yeah. I'm very isolated so I for me it's just an absolutely unbelievable amount that gaming brings me and it's not necessarily about the games themselves yeah oh you're gonna make me cry like <laughs> we've already just started the panel and I'm already welling up damn it Carlo <laughs> um yeah I, th I think we all feel that gosh um, Rue, did you did you do a lot of gaming when you were um, you had your your leak? Yeah, so I I think I'm like seconding everything that Colo said around community, especially. I mean, I've only been streaming for like a few months, and already just like the community aspect of that is is amazing. And I think before that, it I was gaming as a way of an escape, basically. Uh, if I hadn't had Breath of the Wild to play last year, I don't know what I would have done. Um, <laughs> and I think like Colo said, it's something you can do on your own. And I, there was nothing, I couldn't even go to the toilet on my own. And to be able to complete the Master Sword trials was so exciting. Um, and just having that, like as a way to distract yourself from your current pain and physical and mental pain to immerse yourself in a fantasy world or whatever was just an absolute lifeline. And I think now that I've sort of, um, cause I've always gamed, but now that I'm sort of doing it online, it's so amazing to be able to connect with other people and other disabled gamers who it means so much to as well. Um, and I, yeah, especially because like because I can't get out of the house as often to be able to sort of even just playing like co-op games with friends and stuff is just so lovely to be able to do when you're someone that's often isolated so yeah, yeah. gaming is just a huge part of my life yeah it, it can be very isolating living with chronic pain um I think that's that's also what I kind of got from playing games online is that connection and that just meeting other people who like who got it like I met some of my best friends on the internet just from gaming and from streaming and stuff. Um, we all managed to find each other <laughs> in the, the kind of gaming space. Um, Aravia, did you have anything that you wanted to add about what gaming means to you? Yeah, you might see it. I almost like laughed when Colo talked because this is, it's like hearing yourself thinking because like, <laughs> I think this is just something we all just, yeah, because I, I heard or I read an article once just said gaming is so much more than gaming. And I think for disabled gamers, chronically ill uh, gamers, this is a mantra. It isn't. Um, and growing up, since I didn't know I had a brain injury before I was like 13, 14 years, I, for me, gaming was my first meeting with empowerment. Like I did okay in school and all that, but it was always with like a but at the end. It was like, I am good at school, but it takes me a long time to learn to read. I am good at sport, but I'm really slow. I am good at this, but this and this and this. It was like always this like, okay, you're good at thing, but you will never be good enough. And then I'm at gaming and then I'm at uh, empowerment for the first time, because for the first time I was able to just sit down and do something. And I did like, there was nobody testing me. There was nobody sitting like, a, you need to do this because this is the standard for kids. It was just like, you can just sit down and use your time and take your time. And if you use two years or if you use six months, nobody cares. This is just what you need. The game doesn't like, 
technically uh oh, whoa that was a brain freeze <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> the brain uh, the uh, game just doesn't like stop you from trying again it just says like well you can do this try again and for me that was a freedom i didn't meet in society and so when i grew up this was for me a way of escapism has been said and as older as i've become i've understand that this isn't something i uniquely felt this is something a lot of people feel and then to be able to meet in the gaming sphere to talk to other people that understands me because I often feel like I go, as I said earlier, like I have my really strict every day. And then I go to talk to my colleagues, like they are wonderful people. But then I like make a joke about how hard it was to take my pills this morning. And they look at me and go like, you do this every single day. And I'm just like, oh yeah, yeah, that's not normal. Oh yeah, yeah. It's not normal to scratch yourself so much because you're in so much pain. You just start scratching yourself that you start bleeding. Oh yeah, that's not normal. Yeah, I forgot that. So, and then I came to gaming and I met people like you others in the chat there or in the panel here. And I could all of a sudden start talking about these things and not feel like an alien that I was growing up. And yeah, gaming is so important in that way. Yeah, for sure. I think um, it's really interesting that everyone, you know, talks about gaming being empowering and being something we can do independently. And I think that is why it's even more frustrating when games don't allow us to do that, um, which I guess leads us on to the topic of how chronic pain actually affects the, the way that we game. Um, so I'm 100% sure it's different for all of us. Um, me, for example, I don't have a huge amount of pain in my hands. Um, most of my pain is in my neck and my back. So um, I don't tend to have any um, any physical problems with um, using a controller, but I do game from the sofa because it's much more comfortable on my back. Uh, most of my own barriers are cognitive. So um, my memory is real bad. <laughs> um, concentration is really difficult when you're in pain all the time. Um, I have absolutely no sense of direction because I can't remember where I've been or where I'm meant to be going. Um, but one of my biggest barriers is also motion sickness. I get motion sick um, very, very easily. Um, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to get um, to get a, an understanding of how your pain affects the way that you game in particular. Um, Rude, did you want to start? Yeah, so I um, do get a lot of pain in my hands and my wrists, um, especially after sort of prolonged gaming. I mean, I, I, there's only one game that I can use keyboard and mouse for on my PC. Um, every other game I use uh, a pro controller because I've just found that that works best for my hands. Um, but I have to take a lot of breaks. Um, I have like compression gloves. I will have to mm. often break to stretch out my hands and things like that. Um, I can't play like super button mashy games um i very sadly had to give up mortal Kombat, which was one of my favorite games so i prefer playing games that um you can take breaks and that it's not gonna be really confusing to jump back in because of my adhd i've got very short attention span i often don't know what i'm doing which is why i really appreciate things like quest menus and like navigation and things like that to sort of tell me where i'm going because i have no idea um especially like in playing things like stardew valley i know there's a mod that has like a to-do list and that was a true game changer because i never know what i'm doing um but i i think my favorite types of games are ones that have like multiple aspects to them so like i can go and explore or i can cook or like I can fight like if I want to it's sort of like um open world games where you can kind of do what you want with it um but yeah that's sort of how it affects the way I game I think I think yeah. that's everything are there any um are there any genres that you tend to stay away from any particular games that just are not accessible to you whatsoever um I think just like as I mentioned earlier like button mashy games just I mean I've never been able to really get into them um i think there's also some puzzle games that i just can't like my brain just doesn't work that way and yeah i mean i'm the sort of person that will always advocate for like googling if you get stuck and i know that like, that's really controversial but like i sometimes my brain just will not like if i'm so fatigued and i'm stuck and i can't progress unless i do this puzzle like why would i want to just sit and struggle so um i i I think gaming is like, especially for me, like just play the game how you want to play it. I think there's always pressure to like 
do it a certain way and especially with like open world games where they're really like up to you how you want to play it like if you need to google something google it like because there's a there was a lot of shame around that for me but I think um needing that help sometimes like I'd rather do that than sort of get stuck <laughs> yeah yeah for yeah. sure uh Carla did you have any games that you tend to gravitate towards any that you tend to stay the hell away from uh yeah so I I love a narrative game uh, love a narrative game, something that will just draw me in, make me feel all of the things, uh, is just absolutely something that I love. Um, and similarly to what Bruce said, any kind of button mashy games is really, really hard. Any games where I have to hold down a button as opposed to being able to toggle it on. Um, I am completely unable to play a game that doesn't have controller support, uh, because I use the uh, xbox adaptive controller to be able to play games um it then requires different setup depending on which game i have um and uh it really affects how i'm able to know which game i am able to play um so uh for example if there is a, a map of the control scheme before i'm able to play the game that is the biggest relief because i look at it and i'm like does that look like i can play it yes probably as opposed to going okay it's got controller support but is that going to be accessible how much holding i'm gonna am i gonna have to do how much button mashing am i gonna have to do what's bound to which button like what are the, what are the different ways to do that um I think in terms of chronic pain, that is massively affecting because as I mentioned before about being able to play for 10 minutes and then is that actually going to interrupt the game? Is that going to make the game enjoyable? Because even if I can do it, I will get to the, pain, the, the point at some point where it, the pain is so hard that I cannot continue. Um, and on some days I might be able to play more than other days. Um, but again, it's about that trade-off. Um, and also, uh, I think something that is really important to me about uh, choosing games is largely about have, uh, have, have my needs been considered or have the needs of people who do use accessibility options been considered? Um, and so that will also impacts the yeah. games that I choose, because even though I personally don't uh, have any need for uh, like visual accessibility, regardless, I do use subtitles, that really, really helps. Um, if I see that those things have been accommodated within a game, I'm more likely to play it, because I'm like, yeah, yeah. like, they care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They've thought about it, um, which, is, which is really, really amazing. Um, so it massively affects which games I choose. It affects how long I'm able to play for. Um, it affects how I feel about the game and how I feel about the developer. Um, and uh, it also affects what I'm then able to do before or after the game. I mean, you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. Stacey, like people will see uh, me do things some days and then be like, oh, but she couldn't do that another day. Um, and that's really huge for me as well, because if I have to rest and I can't do things for two days before or a day after or, you know, I can't cook myself some food uh, because I've played this game so much, then that's that, that's absolutely not something that I'm able to do. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there's the, it, so I'm completely unable to play unless it's got controller support. If it does have controller support, there will be some trades off. I may, I may still be unable to play. Um, I avoid uh, mostly uh, FPS games mm -hmm. um, or games that are competitive. I avoid games that don't have uh, different um, difficulty options as much as I don't like the term difficulty options um, because I, I find that I, it's not that uh, what some people would consider an easy mode uh, is is what I would find. And again, I'm quoting easy. Uh, but imagine you're running a 100 meter race, like I'm starting 50 meters before the starting line. Um, and being able to have that mode, that's a story mode that is a little more chilled out that I'm able to do that is absolutely game changing. Excuse the pun. There. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and having those really, really, really hard modes that I'm, I'm completely unable to do that. And that leaves me feeling really super isolated. Um, and being somebody who streams so many, sorry, I just turned into a bit of a run. Um, <laughs> like, uh, 
being somebody who streams the majority of their gameplay as well, um, it can be really exhausting. And I, I may have to stop stream. I may have to not be able to do that, not be able to continue the game. And that's, again, quite a hard thing to do uh, emotionally and like mentally. That really sucks, having to do that, getting halfway through a game and finding that there's a button mashy thing that you can't get through. And then either having to really push through it or having to get somebody else to do it for you it just makes you feel like oh, i couldn't do this independently um but yeah i i, I feel like i've gone round the point and maybe not entirely other. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good it's all good um i think it's um it's important as well to talk about those kind of hard versus soft barriers so like a hard barrier would be something that we absolutely cannot do but a soft barrier is kind of one that we can do, but it will probably cause us pain. It will probably cause some kind of, you know, injury or time to recover. Um, and those barriers are still very important to talk about because they could have a massive effect on our lives. Uh, my motion sickness was real bad when I was streaming because I would just push myself through it. I'd be like, well, I'm live. I've got to, I've got to finish. I've got to play this game for another two hours or whatever. Um, there have been games that I've played that have made me so violently sick that I have immediately ended stream and I've had uh, like an eight hour migraine and I've just had to lay in the dark and vomit and listen to an audiobook. And like, that's, that's not cool. You know, I, you, you can lose like almost an entire day from, um, from, getting your motion sickness triggered from um from pain being triggered um so yeah it's it's one of those things that's just very frustrating um as someone that suffers from it um Aravia, did you have anything that you want to talk about kind of uh, games games that you like playing games that are difficult for you yeah so i it's a bit Saying the same because I we have a lot of similar experience, but yeah. I have like my four or five best friends of accessibility. But first, I want to say that I really agree with the fact that if a game is accessible, it's more fun to play, even if it's accessibility I don't need, because you're just like, oh, oh God, I've been thought about. It. Oh my God, <laughs> and it 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 goes a bit into the fact that I am a really big fan of indie games mm -hmm. because I often feel or I can like reach out to them easier um doesn't make um it's not the studio or the devs fault necessarily if they can't be accessible because if you are a big I know you have talked about oh we have talked about it a bit Stacey that if it's a big company it takes a lot of time to like move but so for me in the games that is fun for that then I feel like oh but I need this I can just tweet the developer can we add this and a lot of times they actually just adds it and it's really really fun for me so I really am drawn to indie games to these small things and these a small experience that I don't feel I can get anywhere else mm. but I have my like four best friends of accessibility and the first one is uh the not so popular to talk about, but easy mode, because like, and the fact that you need to change it during gameplay, because my situation fluctuates so much from feeling that it's no problem today to feeling really, really bad. I prefer when I can have a game hard mode one day, like a day I'd really like today, I want to challenge myself. I feel good. And I'm like on the top of the world. And the next day I will feel like poop. And I still want to play the game. So I want to have the possibility to change that mid game. And if I'm stuck to change it from the start, I will most likely not come back to the game either because I was too cocky starting the game and was mm -hmm. like, I'm going to be able to do this. I'm in a good period. <laughs> and then that didn't happen. As so I really prefer when games like give you that option because then I feel like, oh, I can play this whenever. Like this can be a. Um, game that I can come to even in my bad times and also I need pause button because I have my hands that uh, my pain a lot of located in my hand when it comes to gaming and I spasm up mostly due to pain and also due to my cerebral palsy and if that happens I can't do anything there's nothing you can do that spasm will continue until it's done so I need to like pause the game and just put the controller down and just wait and so if I have a game that is difficult on purpose, so I strain my hands a lot and then I can't pause it, then it's just like, oh, so I'm going to lose again then. 
fun. <laughs> no, it's not fun. Those are two really, really big things. Also, the fact that helping me not spasm them up is to change controllers. I need to like have different sizes of controllers. So I just need to plug and play everything. So I can like play five minutes on my keyboard and then like 15 minutes with my Xbox controller. Then I get my PlayStation controller and like change them. So just, I can just not have my hands stay in one position too long. Uh, I think that I had a last one, but I can't remember it. So it's that's okay. okay. Yeah. It's all good. It's the brain fog. <laughs> it's the brain it's, fog. It's just you know, how it is. Everyone gets to see a little brain fog in action with our panels. Exactly. <laughs> it's all good. We're just giving you a, a, a an accurate demo of, of our lives. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's um it's really cool that you you spoke about kind of um you preferring indie games because it's a lot easier to reach out and to kind of, you know, maybe tweet them and be like, hey, there's this, you know, barrier that I'm having, there's this problem that I'm having. Having. um I kind of just wanted to talk a bit about why it's important to kind of do that and to advocate online I know we, everyone on this panel is chronically online I think we're, we're all content creators or retired content creators in my case um, and we're all very loud about our disabilities and, and the things that are important to us online so I just wanted to get your thoughts on why it's important to you to be so kind of open about that and to advocate for that online. Um, Rue, I know that you've been um, advocating online for a long time. Um, how do you feel about that? Why is that important to you? So I, I started a Twitter account just for sort of to explore, like explore and just discuss my experiences as I went off to uni as like a young person with a disability. Um, and people just seem to like it. People just seem to like that honesty and the vulnerability of me sharing my experiences. And a lot of people related. And um, the amount of messages I've had over the years that have said things like, you've helped me get a diagnosis or I've just bought my first mobility aid. Um, and things like they they make me cry every single time um, but they and and people saying like how they just feel less alone and that for me is the main reason why I do what I do because I'm comfortable with doing it and if it can help just one person then I would like be more than happy to do it and it also helps me sort of process what's going on for me as well to share these experiences and for other people to say oh yeah I've had this like um and I spoke to this person or something like that and just making those connections through the online disability community I mean there's things that I wouldn't have known what was going on with if it wasn't for the disability community there's diagnoses that I would not have if it wasn't for the for the disability community <laughs> and it's just it's really validating and like yes that my content helps other people but equally like those people telling me how it's helped them helps me as well so it's like a two-way yeah. thing and and I've got so much back from other people in the online space as well that it's just yeah it's my favorite thing I I love it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, I know that uh, Colo, you do you know a lot of educating people and kind of challenging misconceptions online, especially uh, as an ambassador ambassador for special effect. Um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on on what that's like. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned earlier, I, uh, I, my primate <laughs> 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 try that again. <laughs> uh, uh, when I found out, uh, when I was diagnosed, all right, hold on, stand by. <laughs> <laughs> Pause Ian, button. Ian, please cut this out. There it is. <laughs> um, uh, when I was diagnosed, uh, that was mid uh, streaming for me. So I started my streaming career before I was diagnosed, and I would use the term I became disabled after I started streaming, um, even though I think it was going on far before that, um, it definitely came to a point where there were so many things I was unable to do and so much pain um, that I was then diagnosed. And I think that's really affected the way that I talk about things as well, because I have done so much learning. There was so much that I didn't know. And um, similarly to how Ruth said, there was a lot about my disability that I, I didn't know was related. And then I've seen somebody talk about it and I've 
I've been like, oh no, that weight, seriously, that's a part of it too. Yeah, right, it's just like, <laughs> what? Um, which, is, which is really amazing. And I think that's definitely fundamentally changed my life, being able to have those connections and have that community that's uh, hard to access in a geographical location. Um, I've also found that it's made my content more accessible, absolutely. Um, and I've also found that uh, streaming wise, people tend to come to the stream for the game. Um, those people aren't necessarily people who are seeking out knowledge about accessibility or about disability. So for me, it's really important to bake that into my content um, because that may be something that otherwise wouldn't reach those people. They come for the game and then they maybe learn a little bit and then maybe they think about that next time they play a game and that kind of thing. Um, I, I think especially in terms of uh, invisible disability. So folks that come into my stream, um, I don't have a camera for my foot controls. You aren't able to, to physically see that I use adaptive tech. Um, and I think that's really important important too about uh, kind of I want to say sort of breaking the stigma or the education that actually just because there's not something that you might consider uh, you know your previous conception about what uh, what might look disabled um, it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody doesn't require uh, something to, to be able to help them do things um, so that's really important to me too um, in terms of connecting with other disabled people online has been again absolutely just life-changing for me and that relief and also that validation as well of oh this is not just me this is wait this is an accessibility need this is something that like I don't need to be frustrated with myself anymore because it stops being like this is my fault that I cannot mm -hmm. do this thing and has transformed far more into this is an accessibility need that many people have I'm not alone and actually this is something that I can talk about I can tweet a developer or I can ask somebody hey can you put alt text on your thing can you think about introducing controller support um and as somebody who works with developers um quite closely both in consultancy and with sponsorships uh, throughout my content it's also allowed me to have that conversation with those people and say you know i really appreciate you reaching out about this game or this opportunity but unfortunately i'm not able to play it because it doesn't have controller support the, the response to that almost always is i will feed that back to the team I had no idea like and there's a moment of education there too um and i kind of refer to it as gentle education although i'm not entirely sure that that's the right term um but yeah it's absolutely fundamental to me to bake it into my content um in various ways yeah i love that um and i i, I just had a question about um the fact that you use uh, your feet with an adaptive controller um is there a miscon common misconception where people think that you know all of your barriers are solved with this one controller yeah absolutely yeah. uh so the the primary thing the hard barrier for me is if it doesn't have controller support i can't play it yeah. um but that doesn't mean that if it has controller support i can play it <laughs> um yeah things like true. quick time actions things like toggling mm -hmm uh hold buttons um things like being able to save the game regularly because if i i don't know many of us have already touched on this but if i get to a point where the pain is too much and there's no save point and i have to play for another 20 minutes to be able to hit a save point mm -hmm. i then have to make that decision of do i lose the last half an hour of progress or do i make sure that i can still look after myself for the next couple of days and i'm not in significant pain yeah. um and that's really it hurts uh like emotionally as well like it, it hurts to have to make that choice or to ask somebody else to get through it or um those things um there are some features that i'm able to do through third party uh, applications like through uh a uh what's the word add on what's it called uh like for stardew valley where there's the, the mod brain. yes thank you <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there are some things that can be uh, changed through uh, a mod or through rebinding settings on Steam, for example. Um, but that is still a barrier in itself. Being able to then download those things, being able to then uh, activate those things, being able to then customize those things is an accessibility barrier in terms of being able to set them up. And also it's that same thing of going, oh, if I have to go through all of these things, does do they care? Like 
like that's a bit like do i really want to play this game then if that's if that's something that um that, that isn't important um i think also many uh options that may be considered quality of life upgrades may change my ability to play the game like it's not necessarily a quality of life upgrade like it's very much an accessibility option to me yeah. um so yeah there's absolutely and it's very hard to figure those things out before you play the game not all platforms allow you to submit a request to refund a game um if it's not accessible to you so there's games uh for example on the switch that i would have to spend you know 40 sometimes even 50 pounds on to get that game and then i might play it for 10 minutes and it's not accessible and there's no option for me to report that or there's no option for me to be able to say hey um please could you refund this game it's not it's not accessible um so that's a, a, a barrier as well um in terms of accessibility i feel like i've talked a lot it's very obvious that i have adhd throughout this panel i'm so sorry I'm <laughs> this is just where my brain is today apologies <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. Um, Aravia, I know that you recently um, did your first accessibility review and you've been doing a lot of advocating online. I just wanted to get your thoughts on how that's been for you and why it's important. So I started um, streaming many, many, many years ago. Then I went to hospital for my cerebral palsy and also for my joints. And um, I learned there how to like live with my illnesses and I learned like I had like an epiphany because I had for once doctor saying oh yeah yeah this is this is normal for people like you I am sorry but this is just your new world and going from never feeling like I'm fit in never feeling like I'm good enough never feeling like I, I feel like an imposter or an alien in like a able bodies because I thought for most of my life throughout like up to my 20s said ah oh, well I'm able body I'm just like I call myself like half a lot of time my body just doesn't it just acts half which looking back is really bad to like say things like that about yourself but and nobody corrected me on it everybody was just like yeah she 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 just needs more and then now I realize no it's she's disabled <laughs> and then I started talking about it on stream and my chat went like either, oh, yes, I know this feeling. Can you talk more about it? Or I have never thought about it. Can you talk more about it? So then I started talking about it and then it just piled on. I got to talk more and more about it. And then I met devs and they were just like, I really like what you're saying, but I'm afraid. And I was just like, what are you afraid about? And they were just like, well, I'm afraid that if I add something, either it's going to be piled up that I need to add a lot more of accessibility or that I'm not good enough or that they just don't know what is needed. They like, I have a, like motion sickness. I have a dev's like, but why? What, why? Why is motion blur a problem? And then I tell them about motion sickness. They have never experienced it themselves. They're often young people that develop games and they have never experienced having a body that doesn't handle things as well. And they were just like, oh, I haven't ever thought about it. And all of this suddenly, so it's just piled upon understanding that you need that, which you said, like gentle education. And also the fact that a lot of people are afraid of starting. So I'm trying to give them like, a, hey, you can ask questions. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to not understanding. And it's okay to just understand, I need to add these little changes. This is where I start. On this project, we do these changes. We do these accessibility things. Now we have learned that. Next project, I'm going to add on this. Again, why I love working with indie developers because giving them the reassurance of like, we can understand you can't, you don't have a big, big team of people behind you. You're a single person. You need to start one place at a time. And yeah, really enjoy that. Yeah, I think it's important for people to know that it's okay to start small and everybody yes. has, to, has to start somewhere. Um, and that it's okay to ask questions too. There are so many yes. disabled advocates online that are happy to answer your questions, that are happy to, you know, come in and play test your games with you and, you know, talk about their barriers. Um, because it, it is so hard. Like if you, if you're going to like, I, my eyesight is okay. And if I, somebody said to me like, Hey, how is it playing a game when you're blind? Well, I don't know. I don't have that imagination to figuring it out. And the same for a dev. Like if I just ask uh, my able-bodied partner, how is it playing Elden Ring? He loves Elden Ring. And he's just like, Oh, it's easy. You just do this. He says to me, and I'm just like, well, I can't do that. And he looks at me and goes like, why? 
why can't you do that? And I have to explain it because you you can't have knowledge that either you haven't experienced yourself or somebody had told you. So like it's the legion, uh, like giving them a bit of grace of understanding that of course people can't understand if they don't know or somebody had taught them. So what we are doing with talking to people and advocating and like making a bit of a work as if it's tw on Twitch or in YouTube or in Twitter is just to make people have that little light or little light bulb go, oh, oh, that makes sense. Maybe I can add it next time or start thinking about it when I start making a game so it can be implemented from an early stage. Yeah, exactly. And I don't think that many devs set out to make an inaccessible game. I mean, maybe some people do, um, but you know, most, most people aren't intending to exclude anybody. They just don't have the understanding. They don't have the, um, the personal experience of it. So that's why um, these kind of panels are so great. Why, you know, the games accessibility conference is so great. So we can just hear from so many different perspectives. Um, but yeah, our time is up. That was an absolutely awesome chat. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you everybody watching at home or at the conference in person. I hope you enjoyed our little panel on chronic pain. Um, Future Me will leave some links in the Discord so you can um, follow all these lovely people. So hi Future Me. Um, we, I'm sure we'd all love to chat, chat to you. Um, so yeah, take care and have a great rest of your conference.